Uh, always kindergartens up to fifth grade, we have something very special for you next door. And I know we, uh, we're going to jump back into the book of Exodus, but not tonight, or not, not, not today. Uh, we'll go back into that next week, but I really wanted to kind of take this opportunity. Uh, New Year's. I'm just curious, how many of you guys stayed up until midnight on New Year's Eve? Oh, we got quite a few of you. Now, uh, I got a big confession because I stayed up. I remember back when I was younger, I would stay up and I would watch the ball drop in New York, in Chicago, you know, I would watch it all the way across and uh, a few times I'd make it all the way to Hawaii and watch the ball drop all the way through there and then wake up the next day and go to work and be fine. I'm old now. I, I can't do that. Uh, and so this year, uh, last year, I think we were in bed before midnight uh, last year. This year, I was like, I'm going to stay up. Um, and I got so engrossed in doing a few other things that next thing I know, it was 1 o'clock, and the ball had dropped, and I didn't look. But you know what? It felt the same. I remember when I was a kid. Begging my parents, please can I stay up to midnight? Please can I stay up? And I was in third grade the first time I got to stay up till midnight on New Year's Eve. And I, you know, I thought something magical happened. And I remember sitting in my parents' living room watching TV, and they had some uh, company over. And so the adults were off doing their kind of thing, and us kids were in the room. And then, you know, we shouted, you know, five, four, three, two, one. And we watched the ball drop, and my mom stuck her head in the door and said, all right, it's 12.01, go to bed. And I was like, oh, this is, a, this is a big letdown. You know, if, I mean, if you're not partying, and most of the world turns around and turns it into a big drinking thing, and, you know, if you're not involved in that, it's kind of like, ah, oh, well, what's kind of the point? Because it doesn't, next day just feels the same. You know, I have had to write 2020 a few times, and that takes getting a little used to. And my wife told me, she goes, make sure you write 2020 and not 20, because you, then someone can, at the end of that can write any number they want. So if you just write 20, they could write 2021. And so I was like, oh man. The ad is stressed. Now I got to make sure not only to write the right date, but I have to write the right date right way. Ha. But uh, I suppose you do, unless you do it European, it'd be, what, 20? I don't, I don't know how they do it. Anyways. But the Bible often tells us to pause and reflect. And that's a valuable thing. You know, I don't know if you have a New Year's resolution. You know, this time of year, it, I mean, it, it's all come some kind of scam because now you have all the weight loss programs are all out. Well, that's after Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, I'm a little more plump than I was before the holidays, and then you're up there and you want to jump in on that. Um, you know, oh, we're going to do that. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to give up a habit. I'm going to do all these things. And those are all, all fine and dandy. But, the opportunity we have to stop in our lives and reflect. We did that this morning with communion. The Lord says, often as you do this, you show the Lord's death until he comes. And we do it once a month. We pause to remember what the Lord did for us. So it's a good thing. I, the Bible is often about being reflective. And, and so in light of that, I wanted to do a New Year's message, if you will. Because we have an opportunity to change the calendar, turn the page, have a new start. And as Christians, we can, we can have it all the time. You know, we can ask the Lord to forgive us, and he does. We can have a new opportunity. Every morning, the Bible says, his mercies are new. So we don't have to wait until a certain day to do this. But you know what? Seeing how it's out there, I'm going to take advantage of it. And use that as a time of reflection in our lives. And I can help with thinking, going into the new year, the idea of all the baggage that is left behind. Now, yesterday we had men's breakfast. We had a great men's breakfast, and uh, Steve was a genius. And so he came out with a great illustration. 
And uh, so I told him I was going to use it. I'm going to use it today. But uh, he, he talked about it. If you had like a, a computer or a phone, if you had for a while and it starts slowing down, uh, I have a little tablet here that I use and I can control everything here. And I had this problem. It, it's, it, it's getting slow. It's getting bogged down. And, and I needed something, so I tried to download it. It said, you couldn't download it because of the amount of memory. I don't have enough memory to do what I wanted it to do. And I'm like, there's really nothing on that. Mostly I just use it for Sundays to do this. I'm like, I don't have, well, I've had it now for six years. And so I was going through and I have a little program. I tried, I, I had to install something to figure out what, to install something to figure out what I need. And it's just filled with junk. I have programs I don't even use anymore, you know, apps that are obsolete now. I have things I've downloaded that I thought were important. I have screenshots, because I'm one of these guys that I don't have a great memory. So if I'm in the store and I want to know what the price is, I'll snap a picture of it. So I have it. So I have stuff from six years ago that was price checking in different places that I don't need. After a while, all that baggage just starts piling up and piling up. And, and Steve goes, you know what? Our Christian life is that way. Sometimes over the years, we just accumulate a lot of baggage in our lives, right? Things that are memories and that we're hanging on to, and we don't need it, and we just need to kind of reset. And I thought that was a wonderful illustration because I had to do that on my tablet. Just, I'm like, you know what? That's a good opportunity for us in our lives. You know what? Maybe there's a bunch of baggage. We don't even know it's there anymore. It's dragging us down. And to go from 2019 into 2020, maybe this is a good opportunity to leave some of that baggage that we've just been carrying around, not just maybe the last year, but maybe there's baggage we've been carrying around for years and years and years. Right? And I'm sort of a pack rat by nature. And, you know, and we had a vehicle that died, did the same thing, popped the trunk, and I had more junk that I was carrying around. Things I didn't need, but I had just thrown it in there. But it weighs you down. And in here, I really encourage us to be going into this next year of really getting ready to a lot of this baggage that we've been having. Philippians, this will be our, our main text this morning. I'm really jumping off this. But Paul tells the Philippians, says, Brothers, I do not count myself as having apprehended. Right? Paul says, Look, I haven't arrived. Well, I can tell you, if the Apostle Paul can say that he hasn't arrived, I'm nowhere near. God's still working on me, right? In here, as I look into this life and I look into a message like this, saying you know, all this baggage, I am nowhere near what I should be. And hopefully I'm not what I used to be. Right? And so all of us, I think we can all say, okay, Lord, I'm in this, you know, unless you're perfect this morning, then you can just tune me out and eat lunch later on. But if you're not perfect, listen up. Is that a fair deal? He says, brother, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And we have this, this illustration. There's some things to leave behind and then pressing forward. And going into this next year, like, I believe God has great things in store for you. I think he's got great things in store for this church. As long as we keep pressing on and not just carrying around all our baggage that goes along with it. And there's really, I'm going to say, three areas. And sermons kind of fall into the three points. I always feel that pressure to kind of comply with that. So i got three areas that I want to encourage you this morning that maybe there's some things that you've been carrying around that you need to leave behind this year. First one, leaving unforgiveness. You say, Pastor, you've gone from preaching to meddling. Unforgiveness. To have a clean slate in our lives pressing forward and really just forgiveness really kind of falls in two things. One is forgiving others. Maybe this is a time and opportunity for you to pause and say, you know what? Are there some grudges? Maybe there's some hurt. Maybe there's some other things that you've been hanging on to that you're not up to this point been willing to say, I'm willing to forgive. And in there, the problem with unforgiveness is it turns into 
bitterness. It's so easy, doesn't it, to fall into that. Then in our lives, sometimes the people that cause us the most strife are people that we used to have relationships with. I was thinking about this as I was thinking about the sermon because, you know what? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins, right? You, you can put up with me because you love me. You know, because I'm not perfect. We always establish that. We all stumble. We all fall short. But because of love, we can overlook those things, right? Well, it's interesting because you, you have this way, you know, you love your kids, so you don't see all their faults, right? I mean, someone else sees your kids, and they think, oh, they're brats. And you look at it and say, oh, they're wonderful, right? Because you love them, right? You, you, know, you look at a, a couple newly married, and they're all in love, Right? And then the other person can do no harm. It can do no wrong. Right? And because what happens is love makes it so you don't, at least you're not irritated by the socks on the floor and the toilet seat up or down. Depends on where you are and all that. Right? You're able to overlook those things. But what happens is, is our love wanes. And it's kind of like pulling back the rug. You know, often love is the rug we sweep a lot of our faults under. But when we fall out of love, we roll back that rug, and all we're left with is all the junk that's been piling up over the years. Right? It's all been there. But now what's different is, is your love is no longer covering up those things. And in here, we need to turn around and forgive. The Bible talks about so much about forgiveness. Matthew 18, I, I got credit, we were talking about yesterday. Chris brought up he had a devotion at men's breakfast, and you came to this passage, and I said, this is what I'm preaching on. I'm so glad, Chris, you still came anyways, even though we covered all this. But Matthew 18 is this wonderful passage. It talks about the idea of forgiveness. And it starts off with, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall, I, shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Peter thought, all right, you know what? I don't know who he had in mind. And I'm sure when I talk about the idea of forgiveness, maybe a name pops into your head. I'm not going to ask for that. That's up between you and the Lord, right? I, I have found over the years that there are sometimes there's someone in your life that you just mention their name. And it's like, right? You have to say nothing about that person or anything else. So mention that person's name, all of a sudden gets you all angry and upset, right? Well, there's something there. And maybe you need to forgive. And Peter says, you know, seven is the number of completion. He says, oh, Jesus, you know, there's someone in my life. I can forgive him seven times. That's doing really well, right? And Jesus says, uh-uh. Jesus said to him, do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And I know right off the bat someone's going to say, oh, only 490 times. That's not the point. The thing is that we are called to forgive over and over and over and over. Because God has forgiven us over and over and over and over. Can I tell you something? I love forgiveness when I'm on the receiving end of it. I love it when people forgive me. You know, Pastor, you forgot something. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, I like it. Right? You know, I love forgiveness when I'm on the side of it. When people overlook my faults. Well, if I love so, forgiveness so much, why am I so difficult in forgiving other people? Right? And Jesus goes in in chapter 18 here, and he talks about a parable, and he says, look, there's a man who owns his master an insurmountable amount of money, something that he can never, ever pay back. And the master brings him in, he throws himself down, and he says, mercy, please have mercy on me. And the master looks at him and goes, I will forgive you all your debt. Woo-hoo! And he goes out, how exciting it is. Forgiveness is great when I get it. But then the story takes a nasty turn. 
Still in Matthew 18, it says, And then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? See, what happened was this servant who was forgiven, he went out and found someone who owed him just a couple bucks. It says, you owe me. You need to pay me. And he goes, I can't do it. So he had him thrown in the prison. The master found out and said, wait a minute, I forgive you all of this, and you can't forgive just a little bit. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. How can we ask God to forgive us if we're not willing to forgive? The debt I have gone against him is so great compared to what you have done against me. that in someone who enjoys forgiveness should be so freely to give it out. Now, it's interesting because you talk about the idea of forgiveness and sometimes the answer is, you know what, but you don't understand what was done to me. There's a couple things I want to talk about the idea of forgiveness, all right? First one, forgiving someone doesn't mean you justify what they've done. All right? Because maybe what they have done was wrong, and maybe it was bad, and maybe it was hurtful. By you saying, I forgive you, does not mean what they did was right. Because sometimes it wasn't. All right? Second thing, forgiveness doesn't absolve someone from it. What happens is, you know, we've kind of warped this into, into something, because, you know, say you've done something to me, you hurt me. And I, and I choose to forgive you of that. Doesn't mean that my hurt all of a sudden goes away. Doesn't mean that there's consequences to it. Right? Years ago, um, I was knocking my door and I had a gentleman who had cheated on his wife. And he goes, my wife found out, Pastor, you come over, I'm trying to save my marriage. So we sat down and he told his whole story of what happened. And she was hurt. You know what? She had every right to be hurt. What he did was wrong. And, and she goes, I will choose to forgive you. Well, fast forward about a week or two, and he comes to me and goes, Pastor, he goes, you got to talk to my wife because she hasn't forgiven me. I said, what do you mean? She goes, she's still hurt. She still doesn't trust me. She still doesn't. I said, look, Forgiveness doesn't all make, make what, he, what you did right. It doesn't automatically take away the hurt and the pain. And, and trust is something that you're going to have to earn. All of a sudden, she's not going to trust you just because she forgave you, right? So trust doesn't all of a sudden, just all of a sudden doesn't make as if it never happened. Second, uh, third thing is forgiveness is not an emotional response. It's an intellectual choice. Forgiveness happens in, in the brain, not necessarily the heart. Right? Uh, years ago, we were at, uh, had my oldest daughter, she was playing in the playground, and she came up to me, she was in tears, and she came up and she goes, there's this boy on the swing, and he hit me. Well, you don't mess with my girl. So I grabbed her by the hand, we went over, I said, what boy was it? And so we went to the boy, I said, okay, where's your parent? And she pointed to go, my mom's over there. So I went over to the mom, and I said, all right, you tell him what happened. And she's like, your son punched me. And she looked at the boy and goes, did you punch her? He goes, yes. So I'm like, all right, this is going to be good. And so we kind of stood there for a bit. I said, well, he owes her an apology. And the mother looked at me and then looked at the little boy and said, do you want to say you're sorry? The little boy's no. So I'm waiting. And the mom's like, he goes, he doesn't want to say it. I'm like, yes, so he needs to apologize. Well, if he doesn't mean it, then it doesn't mean anything. So I uh, 
learning session with my daughter, walked away because I would have made my daughter say it. Because it's the right thing to do. And what happens is when we choose to forgive, we intellectually say, I'm choosing this. I'm, it's a choice. Well, what happens is the heart will follow. It may take a while. In the case of the man who cheated on his wife, she forgave him. Didn't take away the hurt. Didn't take away the, right? But as she chooses to do that, her heart will follow. So, emo so emotionally, well, I forgive, but I, I'm not, I don't have that immediate release but the heart will follow our actions. Last thing is forgiveness isn't always two-sided. Sometimes when we choose to forgive, we can forgive someone who has never even asked for it. Right? I mean, over the years, I know people who are angry at dead people. Well, they're not going to come back and ask you to forgive them. But you can choose to forgive. Right? In our lives, there are people, because of their wicked hearts, that may have hurt you and abused you, that will never come to you, will never ask you for forgiveness, but you can choose to forgive them anyways. And sometimes it's the best choice because without that, we end up with a seed of bitterness that comes in. And that root of bitterness can seek into our hearts, and that is so much harder to remove because bitterness will just worm its way, root its way right into our hearts. And it's so hard to remove that once it takes place. So we're warned not to let any root of bitterness happen in our lives. So in this, we need to turn around. Forgiving is, though. Forgiving others as God has forgiven us means that we resolve not to revoke revenge. What happens is, when we choose to forgive, we give up the right for retaliation. The best way to think about this is, you know, imagine you have a loan at the bank. Maybe it's a mortgage, maybe it's a car loan, right? And all of a sudden the bank comes up and says, okay, you know, we choose to forgive you of your debt. Woohoo! Right? Oh, happy day that would be, right? And that means I, right, you don't have to pay them anymore. It's forgiven. That means the bank can't come to you and say, hey, where's my money? No, it's forgiven, right? You've given up the right to ask for payment back. That's what forgiveness is. God says, he will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I give up that right for my pound of flesh. I've given it up. At this point, you don't owe me for what you've done. I've given that up. Forgiving others can be the most powerful thing that you can do this year. The flip side of forgiveness is maybe I need forgiveness. I need to seek forgiveness. Maybe there's something I have done. Maybe I'm the offender. And maybe there's someone over the years that I have hurt and I have left a trail of pain behind me and I need to fall on my knees and, and ask for forgiveness of God. I need to ask forgiveness of other people to come up through. Matthew tells us, as Jesus was teaching, he says, there, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. God says, look, don't come and worship me and say everything's okay between me and God if I have unresolved issues with those around me. First John tells us, Beloved, let us love one another. For everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He who loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. One of the effects of having God in my life is that he pours out that love and that forgiveness to those around me. And maybe I've done something that I need to reach out and say, look, forgive me. Maybe I'm the one who needs to take the first step. Right? Because over the years, you know, so many times I've heard, you know, you got two people, and they, you can't even remember who's at fault anymore. Who started it? Right? I mean, I remember those, those days in the car, right? Going down the road. My mom would turn around as my brother and I were fighting in the back seat. You know, my mom's like, don't make me come back there. Right? And you know, we always say, well, he started it. Or she started it. And my mom says, look, I don't care who started it. I'm going to finish it. Ooh, all right. 
right? Maybe you're in a situation that you need to take the first step. Maybe as part of your testimony, you said, you know, because I love Jesus, I want people to know I love Jesus, and I'm going to reach out and ask forgiveness. Maybe you weren't 100% to blame. Maybe, maybe your part was small. Open that door and go and seek forgiveness. Don't carry around that baggage. Don't ba- carry that into the next year. Resolve what needs to be resolved. Do what needs to be done. And sometimes what that means is, is not just asking forgiveness, but the, the Bible talks about this idea of reconciling, of restoration. And what that means is you come forward and say, okay, you know what? Uh, not only do I ask forgiveness, a verbal thing, but is there something I need to do to make this right? What do I need to do? And we fall short on that. You know, sometimes you want to say, oh, I'm forgiven. All right. And we just walk away. We left hurt and pain. And sometimes what we need to say is, is there something I need to do? Uh, last year about this time, I was in the parking lot in Hannaford. And I opened the car door and a wind came up and took my door, flung it open, and I smashed the, window, the mirror of the car next to me. And the lady was out there with two little kids and it just, it just shattered that mirror. It was like, whoo! Whoops! She came over and looked, and I went over and looked, and I said, I'm so sorry. She goes, I'm sorry, too. Then I got in the car and drove away. No, right? No, right? I said, I'm sorry, but guess what? There's still a broken mirror. I did tell her, I said, you know, here's my information and all that. I said, you know, I'd rather pay you out of pocket than go through the insurance. And so I gave her my information, and she went down the reds to get it fixed, and I went down there, and I told the guy, you know, whatever needs to be done. Right? I I said I was sorry, but it still left the hurt. It still left the bruise. And to make that, you know, if I met you, I said, well, you know what? I asked forgiveness. I'm the pastor of the church up the road. Yeah, right? Take care of your own thing, right? That well left a sour taste. So we did it on the reds, and he fixed it, and I paid the bill. Why? Because it was the right thing to do to make it right. Because I was sorry, I followed it through. It cost. And, and sometimes if I'm in the wrong, sometimes I'm in the fault, sometimes what we need to do is say, look, is there something I need to do? And sometimes they'll turn around and say, well, no. But maybe there is something that we can do to take that step. To show a forgiving heart. In Ireland, in, in Dublin, in St. Pa- Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, there was a feud. And there's two factions that were fighting, two clans that were fighting. And it's interesting because one is covered and invaded the other, and there's back and back and forth. Well, one of, one of the clans ran into the cathedral, St. Patrick's Cathedral, in Dublin, and they went in there, they locked the door. And they seized themselves in, and all of a sudden now we have a standstill. Well, the ones that were laying siege to it finally turned around and said, you know what? We need to, we need to forgive. So it's interesting. So he turned around and, and got one of his axemen to come and cut a hole in the door. And I don't know if you can see that, but this is the actual door not on the door anymore. It's inside the, inside the, but St. Patrick's Cathedral, there's this, and that's the hole they cut in the door. And the leader of the clan that was outside shouted through and says, look, we want peace. We want to lay this down behind us. He goes, take your hand and put it through the hole of the door and we will shake hands over the new peace. Well, imagine being inside that the people with the army on the outside, what's going to happen when you shove that, your arm in through there? <laughs> exactly, right? Well, they waited, and the call went forth, stick your hand out. It was like, no. Well, we want peace. I'm not sticking my hand out there for nothing. So the man who was in power and authority, who was holding out the siege on the outside. 
he took his arm and put it through the hole. It says, we want peace. That's a big chance. I mean, he had all the power. He had all the authority. He had all, right? I mean, he, he had the other ones at their mercy. But he put his arm through the hole. And the other leader took his hand and shook it and walked out friends. Walked out in peace. And maybe that's where we are in our life. I don't know who started it. I don't know all the details. I don't know the, the depth of the pain or the hurt and the pain that's left behind. But I will tell you this. If you are a Christian, you have experienced the forgiveness of God for whatever you have done against the Almighty Creator God, and He has forgiven you. He took that chance and took His hand and put it through the hole and reached out to us. And He asked us to do the same for those around us. Maybe you're here and you're like, I don't want to forgive. I don't want to move on. God says, have you experienced my forgiveness? Forgive. Don't carry that weight. Don't carry that burden into this new year. Leave it behind. Have a new start. It's amazing what happens when you ask forgiveness. It's like taking that box, that burden that's on your shoulders and dropping it off. The weight will be lifted. Healing will start. And God will get the glory. That was one point. I got two and I'm out of time. So I guess we'll pick this up next week. But going into the next year, folks, don't carry your luggage. Don't carry it. It will weary you. It will wear you down. It will rob you of your joy that he offers you in the Lord. And I believe with all my heart, a lot of big part of it comes with the idea of forgiveness. And you know, the minute I say that, you have, you have a person that comes to mind. Forgive. Ask forgiveness. And in doing so, allow the peace of God to wash over you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I thank you that you forgave me. Lord, there is no sin that your grace isn't greater. There's nothing I can do that you will not love me more. Lord, help me take the fact that I'm forgiven and turn that to those around me. Lord, give me the power to forgive. Lord, I need a supernatural ability to do it. I, Lord, I can't do it in the flesh. But Lord, with God, all things are possible. Through the Holy Spirit, Lord, you can lead us, encourage us, and strengthen us to forgive and move on in healing. Lord, maybe I've done the offense. Maybe, Lord, I need to say, I'm sorry. Lord, help me do what needs to be done as much as I can to live at peace with those around me in forgiveness and in peace. Lord, we thank you for what you are able to do. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. As you please stand, we're going to sing the song.